Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast again. And this is my second video in a series I hope to do of short videos looking at some of my favorite articles from 2020, favorite journal articles. I'm going to review them and kind of put my own spin on them and kind of connect them with some of my ideas. The one I want to talk about today is one of my favorite topics. And for those that listen to my other content, you'll know I talk about this a lot is the relationship between uh, the outcome of a movement, you know, performance outcome, and the movement that created it. And particularly, I want to focus on variability, asking the question, you know, how consistently do we need to be able to move to produce consistent movement outcomes, right? And in you know, traditional motor learning, there's been two very distinct views about this, right? The traditional information processing motor program view is that vari movement variability is noise, right? So we want a consistent outcome, right? In, in all views, that's what we want. So in, if here I'm illustrating it with my favorite example, baseball batting, right? The consistent outcome we want is consistent barreling of the ball. We want the ball to hit the center of the bat, the center of percussion, the sweet spot on the bat every time if we can, right? That's a consistent outcome we're looking for. The traditional view is that to achieve this, we need to be able to practice and practice until we get a repeatable swing. That is, the goal is to make the variability in the movement, right, in all parts of the movement as low as possible, right, to have consistency, repeatable movement. That's kind of the traditional view. The alternative, um, um, so, and you could think of this, you know, this is essentially repetition through repetition, right? We're trying to repeat the outcome by repeating the movement. The alternative view, of course, is the ecological view where we don't think about movement variability as noise. We think about it as essential uh, to success, right? It's, it's required, it's functional, right? So the idea here is in order to achieve consistent barreling of the ball, right, the consistent outcome, not only are we going to use movement variability, it's required, right? Because the situation is always changing. The, the pitch is changing. The constraints are changing. So, you know, for example, the, the image I show, I, I taken um, from Bart, um, a hand graph is the, you know, we needed to adjust our, the, the position of our body to hit pitches at different heights. So in order to achieve consistent movement outcome variability in the ecological view requires some level of movement variability, right? And that's the idea of repetition without repetition. We're going to repeat our outcome, but not by repeating our movement. And the main way that we think this um, functional variability occurs is through the development of motor synergies, right? So what's going to happen is the different components of our movement, right? The different elemental variables, as Bernstein called it, in our movement are going to work together to help make the outcome more consistent, right? And so we're gonna get what's called co-variation. So my shoulder and my elbow aren't just gonna move on their own, they're going to compensate for each other. They're gonna to work together, right? In, in, in a synergistic fashion, right? And so this is kind of an example of this. This is what I found essentially in my recent baseball batting study. This is looking at the timing of the weight shift in uh, hitting a baseball pitch, you know, shifting your weight back versus shifting it forward. And what I found from a swing to swing, there's a very strong correlation between these two elemental parts of the movement, right? You, if you shift your weight back a little bit longer, you move forward a little bit faster, right? So they work together. So we're not, our goal isn't trying to just reduce the variability of both of those, right? We want them to work together, right? We want them to co-vary. So um, so that we might expect, you know, fairly high amount of movement variability because some trials is going to have to be very different than the other trial because they're, they're working together, right? So this is the idea of motor synergy. And in the study I want to talk about today was a study published in Frontiers um, looking at baseball pitching, right? So Matsuo and colleagues did a really interesting study looking at baseball pitching. So what they were interested in was looking at the relationship between the consistency of outcome and the outcome they were looking at was the, the hand position at the ball release of a pitcher, right? Um, that's the outcome we want. We want that to be consistent. And I'll show you some evidence of that in a second. How does that relate to the movement that created that hand position, right? Obviously, in a baseball pitcher, the getting that hand 
um, there requires movement of the whole body, right? Movement of the lower body, upper body, pushing from the ground, shoulder, elbow, wrist, right? So how are those two things related is re really the question they were asking in the study. And so hand position in baseball pitching, if you look at it, right, um, the term you hear more often associated with this is release point, right? Where was the hand in space when the ball was released? And there's lots of data you can look at online. And you can there's a, a, a great website called Brooks Baseball where you can actually find this for any pitcher you want, any pitch type, any segment. Here's a couple of examples I've just shown uh, for different pitches. If you plot, here's the vertical release point and the horizontal release point. Um, you see it. Th th this is the spread. This is a really interesting one for Tampa Bay uh, from last year. Um, you can see there, there between the pitchers, there's very different release points, but they're very consistent within each other and some more consistent than the others. Um, if you look at one individual pitch type, you get even greater consistency. So I have really relatively low outcome variability in terms of release point hand position. Um, there's been some, some studies that have measured this and it can get as low as three centimeters, the standard deviation of hand position, which is about half the size of a baseball, right? So incredible consistency. So that's what we want to try to explain. How do we get this outcome consistency? And the question is, is this low variability in hand position produced by reducing the variability in all the component movements that created it, right? So getting my variability of knee position, knee, hip angle, shoulder angle, wrist angle, as consistent as possible, com producing the exact same elbow angle motion on every pitch, producing the exact same knee bend on every pitch. So is it created by trying to reduce the variability of all the components or through co-variation of the components? Okay, so we're not trying to get them all as low as possible. We want them to work together, right? So we, we want some variability from trial to trial because they're going to have to work together from trial to trial. And to address these possibilities, the authors of this paper used a really interesting method called the, uh, well, first of all, Basically, what they did was they took 12 semi-pro uh, pitchers, had them motion tracked, so motion tracking system where they're wearing reflective markers while they're pitching. They threw a series of fastballs at a target on the wall. The um, What they did was have them keep throwing until they, they got 10 pitches from each of them that were relatively high velocity and hit the target. Okay, so they, what they called successful pitches. And it's important to point out here that the average velocity of the successful pitches was only 83 miles an hour, right? So we're not talking about super elite pitchers here, right? But so that's an important point. Although I don't, you know, think we would expect much difference in terms of the, the actual um, results uh, here, but it is an important thing to point out. But so, the, so they took this data and the method that they used to try to distinguish between those two possibilities, right? Is it a repeatable delivery or co-variation is right, what we're trying to distinguish. The method they use is what's called the permutation method, which is a really uh, interesting method developed by uh, Mueller and Standard in 2003 they used. And it's a really interesting method. So I'm going to walk through the steps of it in a very, very basic view. It's, a, it's, you know, it's a bit more complicated than this, but I think this covers the basics. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the uh, the movement, several movements, executions of a single performer, right? So we're going to take, in this case, we're going to take those 10 successful pitches from one pitcher, right? So I've shown down below, we've motion tracked their body for 10 separate pitches, right? I've only shown five there, but so we're going to start with that. We're going to take that. Then what we're going to do is we're, instead of actually taking the kinematics and movement data from one trial and looking at it, then looking at the next execution, then looking at the next, what we're essentially going to do is we're going to scramble them up, right? So what we're going to do is re recreate one single pitch movement, one single delivery, by instead of using the data from that one delivery, we're going to reconstruct it by using joint angles and movements from other deliveries, right? So maybe we would take the knee angle from the first pitch, the hip angle from the second pitch they threw, the elbow angle from the third, the wrist angle from the fourth, the knee angle from the fifth, right? So what we're going to do is reconstruct a movement by randomly picking segments, the component elements from different one different pitches, different executions, okay? And we'll see why we we'll do this in a second, right? So that's what we're going to do. 
Then what we're going to do is we're going to compare this, okay, this new reconstructed movement. We're going to look at for this new, re, new reconstructed movement, if we look at the variability in the hand position, the variability of the outcome, okay, we're going to compare this across different types of these reconstructions, okay? So what we're going to do, for example, is we're going to uh, compare a random reconstruction, right, which is what I just described. So we're reconstructing one movement by taking the elements from different executions, randomly picking them, right? So that's what I've tried to show with those green circles. We're going to compare that to what is the variability in hand position relative to the actual movement, okay? In the actual movement, we're going to take the joint angles from the actual one throw, one execution, right? So all the green circles are on the one execution. So, so we're going to compare it to the actual one. And then we can also do some more fancy things. We can take, we can reconstruct a movement where we take all the uh, lower body joint uh, angles from the one throw, okay, the actual throw, and the all the upper ones from randomly picking them from others, right? So we can pick the elbow, shoulder, wrist, et cetera, from, from other uh, ones. And we can combine those. And we can do the same thing with the lower body, right? And so the actual way they illustrated this in the paper is, is a table. So um, in the measured, the first column is the actual. So there's, there's the joint angles they were measuring, okay, angles and position. The second one is um, importantly, I'll talk about this in a second. They call it covariation free. This is the random reconstruction. Okay. So lowercase, uh, not bolded means we picked it from a random execution. So we're going to recreate a pitching movement by picking the, the wrist angle from one, the pelvis from another, the knee from number seven, the ankle position from number three, et cetera. And then there's the two other uh, examples I, I mentioned where you can take some of them from the one movement in bold and some of them randomly pick, picked from other movements in, in uh, non-bold there. Okay, so that's the basic idea. We're gonna compare the actual movement taken from one versus the these reconstructed movements. And why do we do this? Why do we go through this, this kind of, this exercise of, of reconstructing this? Well, it allows us to make uh, comparisons and, and test whether there's covariation going on, okay? So think about if I take uh, the actual movement where I'm picking all the joint angles from one particular execution versus the random reconstruction where I'm picking them from random out of the 10, each one, right? If my goal in pitching is to just get the variability as low as possible for each movement, if I have a perfectly repeatable delivery, right? So I, my elbow angle is the same on every pitch. Then it shouldn't matter which execution I take it from, right? It shouldn't matter that I take my shoulder from uh, angle from one execution and my elbow angle from another, right? If the goal is to get them as low as possible, they're, work, they're independent from each other, right? It doesn't matter which one I take it from, right? They, if I have a perfectly repeatable delivery, then I should be able to re reconstruct one delivery from any of them, right? But instead, if there's covariation going on, it will matter, right? Because covariation means the elbow angle I have on one trial depends on the shoulder angle I have on that trial. If my shoulder angle is slightly wider on this pitch, I make my elbow angle slightly narrower or lower, right? So the covariating together to keep my hand position, the outcome variability low. So if the, if the variability in my hand position is higher when I do this random reconstruction, it means there's covariation going on, right? Because random reconstruction is going to remove covariation, right? If I pick shoulder from one trial and elbow from another, they can't, they can't work together, right? They don't, they, that's right. So if the, uh, the uh, variability in hand position, the outcome variability is larger for random reconstruction, then we can say there's covariation going on. The other thing we can do is we can look at the upper and lower, right, to identify where this covariation is happening, where this functional covariation is happening. If there's a difference between the upper and the actual, then we could say it's happening in the upper body versus the lower body, okay? So that's the basic logic of this. So essentially, we're scrambling things to remove covariation, right? right? And if, so if covariation doesn't matter, then scrambling shouldn't matter. So what do they find here? So let's look at the results. So what they've plotted here is the standard deviation of the angle of the hand, 
right? So the, the hand at the release point. So this is the outcome variability, right? We want this to be low, right? Always, no matter what theory <laughs> you talk about. And and they, they plotted it for different um, angles of the hand in the different directions, right? So they plotted both the angle and the orientation in the azimuth and elevation, right? The most critical thing you see in this graph is if you look at, um, so, and then for each of these, they've shown those four different conditions, uh, the, the reconstruction conditions. And what you can clearly see, right, and all these differences were significant. I've moved the top of the graph that shows the stars for significance so I can see clearly the lowest variability in outcome and position occurs when you take the movements all from the same execution, okay, from the measured or actual right? That's clear evidence that there's co-variation going on. When you scramble them, right, in the co-variation free, that's why they call that co-variation free, right? When you reconstruct it from different executions, you've removed co-variation. You can see it's, um, you know, it's more than double, right? You've, you've raised the, the variability of outcome. So clearly, there's evidence that outcome variability in hand position is being, being created by covariation in the joints, the joints working together. The other thing you can see uh, in this graph, um, if you look at the, um, in the, if you compare the arm and the leg, you can see the arm, which is the one farthest to the right in each of those groups, the, arm, the leg one is consistently lower okay, than the arm. Okay, it's, still, it's still higher right, than the, the um, full actual one, but you can see that it is lower. So. Um, so basically, overall, what the results are showing is the standard deviation of hand position is larger for reconstructed motions than actual, strong evidence of covariation. Um, the standard deviation, deviation of hand position is lower in the leg condition, right? Suggesting that a large part of this, you know, maybe most of this consistency in hand position is created by covariation in the bo lower body interestingly, right, in joints in the lower body, right? So I think this is a really, really interesting study, and I really like this method. I thought it's a kind of a alternative to using an uncontrolled manifold method to understand the, the relative importance of variability. So the conclusion, direct quote from the paper I love, you know, amen, it implies that regulating variabilities rather than reducing variabilities are necessary to pitch accurately, right? So good pitching does not come from a perfectly repeatable delivery. It comes from having motor synergies, being able to have your joints work together on each execution um, because they're going to vary, right? It comes from repetition through without repetition, right? Being able to have these things working together in this example. So uh, as I said, I really like this finding. I think it was a really interesting study. Overall, I think it was very well done. The, the limitation of one Limitation I mentioned, of course, is the level of the pitchers, which you might challenge, you know, could be different. I'm not sure. Uh, I would predict the same thing for higher level pitchers. Just, you know, the variabilities are probably even lower uh, that we're talking about. So it might be um, challenging to find the effects because they're buried in, in really low variability. Um, but, but I think the effects would be the same. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I did a previous episode looking at this. I called it, how consistently we do we need to be able to move to can be consistently successful? Episode 156 of the podcast, you can have a listen to that. I cover some other uh, research, which I think shows very, very similar effects to this. But I would recommend, as this is a Frontiers paper, so it's uh, open access. You can find a copy um, and a link in the show notes of the paper. So I hope you enjoy that again. I'll be along at some point. Uh, I'm probably not going to have a regular schedule. Just whenever I feel like reading uh, these papers and reviewing them again, uh, I'll put these out, um, paper reviews, um, and I hope you enjoy this. So this is, uh, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and cheers for now.